I want to call this uh, lecture Coming to America, and I think it's fun to start out by saying that none of the three big guys of Methodism were able to get anything going here in America. George Whitfield, that great Calvinist preacher who was considered the best preacher of Methodism, he toured America, drew large crowds, started a little group in Delaware, and when he left, it died. Uh, Charles and John Wesley, they were here in Georgia, and they were here for a little bit of time, and they weren't able to get anything moving unless sneaking out of America is considered moving. Um, <laughs> the first apostle of American Methodism was Robert Strawbridge and Philip Embury. They came to America in the 1760s uh, from Ireland because, well, their families were starving. And they came to America unaware of each other's presence. They came here and began the first Methodist movement in America. Strawbridge organized the first successful society of Methodists, resulting in numerous conversions. Many of these converts went on to become class leaders and preachers. Strawbridge soon encountered a lot of problems that had not been faced in the old world. See, Methodism in Britain was one of a number of church renewal movements happening at the time. And because it was a renewal movement, it wasn't a substitution for the Church of England, the Methodist services were on purpose incomplete. They were incomplete by design because they weren't meant to replace participation in the local parish. Therefore, Methodists were expected to participate in the local Anglican church for the other needs, for things like communion and baptism. Well, Wesley had intended this to be the case for all Methodists. But there was a big problem in America for Methodists. One, there wasn't an Anglican church on every corner. And two, because of the conflict that was brewing between the colonies and England, a lot of folks were exiting the Anglican church because they saw it as a symbol of the very thing they had declared independence from. A young couple in Strawbridge's Methodist Society had recently experienced the birth of a child and they needed this child to be baptized. They came to Strawbridge and they said, we want our child baptized. Strawbridge, being a good Methodist, knew that he wasn't allowed to do that. He was a local preacher and he wasn't allowed to perform baptism. But here was a couple in need of baptism for their child. So Strawbridge became the first Methodist preacher to begin establishing the sacraments in the Methodist meetings. He baptized that baby. Now, this is an interesting note. Because he did that, Francis Asbury struck his name from our registrar in historic preachers. So, so that's why he, he's almost an invisible figure. Strawbridge was also the first Methodist preacher to begin establishing a preaching circuit. He established 30 preaching stations throughout Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Now, meanwhile, in New York, Philip Embury and his family came to New York to escape poverty. They joined another denomination, but they didn't like it and they dropped out. They, have, have you ever known folks who just kind of drop out? They're just, uh, <laughs> Philip became rather lax in his Christianity and it was Barbara Heck, his cousin, who really could take the credit for getting Philip back on the straight and narrow. I wanna see if I can get this next picture. Uh, if you can see what this is, this is a picture, it's kind of illustration. Barbara Heck has, has come into the room. She's found her cousin Philip, who used to be a Methodist preacher, playing cards, and, and she says, we're all headed to hell if we don't stop this foolishness. She grabs the cards from them and throws them into the fireplace. And she says, buddy, you get back to preaching. Philip said, I don't have a congregation. I've got no preaching post. He says, well, who am I going to preach to? You? She said, I'll provide the congregation. She goes out. She rounds up some people. She brings them home. And Philip starts preaching. From the beginning, what's remarkable about this is that it begins multiplying immediately. Thousands of people start becoming Methodists, to start becoming Christians through the preaching of Philip Embury. And what's remarkable is from the very beginning, blacks and whites worshiped together in those Methodist societies. And many of them, blacks and whites, became preachers, class leaders, became prominent people in the Methodist movement in New York. Now, Methodism took off. Methodism took off. But you need to understand for a minute that this early success was still something that made Methodism barely noticeable. 
John Wigger in his book, Taking Heaven by Storm, notes that in 1770, there were only about a thousand Methodists in all of America. By 1775, only one in every 800 Americans were Methodist, but all of this quickly changed. By 1820, there were more than 250,000 Methodist. By 1812, we were, we were starting two churches or preaching posts a day, two of them a day. And by 1850, there were more Methodist preaching posts than post offices in this country. Within just a few years of its start, Methodists began meeting in conferences. And there's really two of them that we need to talk about. The first one, 1779, Methodism has not yet officially become a church, but the Southern preachers decided that they needed a church and they voted to ordain each other. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure how that happens. I, I'm not sure if the lay hands you sort of hug each other. I'm not, not really sure how that worked out, but they voted to, to ordain each other and uh, Francis Asbury had to go south to tell him, you can't do that. You can't do that. In 1780, he met with them to try to work out a compromise. They told him to hit the road, and Francis Asbury left, thinking the church was about, well, the Methodist movement was about to split. But they called him back and said, we'll reconsider. We'll, we'll make a moratorium here. We'll, we'll, we'll hold back on doing sacraments, at least for a while. 1784, at the Christmas conference, uh, Methodism becomes a church in America. 1784, Wesley agrees that the movement needs its own leaders. He sends Thomas Koch and a number of other folks to, to bring it to life, to give it birth. One of the things that uh, I, I think is interesting, they met during Christmas. We think that's an odd time to meet, but in the 18th century, Protestants didn't celebrate Christmas. They recognized it, and they would preach and teach a little bit about Jesus' birth, but they didn't do Christmas trees. They didn't do Santa Claus. They didn't do family get-togethers because that was Catholic. And it's not until the 1840s, 1850s, the evangelicals, Protestants in America start celebrating Christmas. Okay, Thomas Koch, Francis Asbury. Uh, to understand early American Methodism, you need to understand circuit riders. There's a 19th century proverb that is, uh, talks about inclement weather. And the proverb goes like this, there's nothing out today but crows and Methodist preachers. <laughs> what I think's uh, remarkable, remarkable about Methodism in its early days is that they had a shortage of preachers and were doing fine without them. Uh, having a shortage of preachers did not seem to be a real problem for them. I mean, we, we talk about it as if it's like the collapse of our church. They thought they could get by with just a few of us, and they did great. American Methodism, to understand the circuit writer, you need to understand Francis Asbury, America's first bishop. He served for about 45 years. During this time, he rode a quarter of a million miles on horseback, including crossing the Allegheny Mountains more than 60 times. He preached more than 17,000 sermons and stayed in more than 10,000 homes. He set the pace and the example and never was exceeded by any other circuit rider. In early Methodism, there were itinerants who were the circuit riders and there were local preachers. Circuit riders were assigned to a charge that would be somewhere between 200 and 500 miles in circumference. And they were expected to complete this circuit, visit every preaching point along the way every two to six weeks. They had to stay on the road a lot. They were, they were financially supported by the conference. And in those days, only itinerants were members of the conference. Local preachers were not. These circuit riders faced dangers of every kind and often they only owned what they could carry on horseback. While traveling, they would lodge in the homes of Methodist people, and this was not always a pleasant thing. <laughs> circuit riders from the early days talk about things like eating rotten food. One circuit rider records that when he stopped at the post, he was invited to share the dinner with a local family. They had uh, two cauldron boiling pots on the fire. One of them, they were melting down horse bones for glue. The other, they were making soup for the family and both kept boiling over and bubbling into each other. One, one circuit rider records that the fleas were so bad in the home where he was staying that he thought it better to go out and sleep under a tree. 
Uh, sometimes there were only there would be only one bedroom and one bed, and sometimes they would share the bed with the whole family. <laughs> one circuit writer records that the room he stayed in was so drafty that by the time he woke up, the snow was about two inches deep in the bedroom. Now, why would someone put themselves through such risk and suffering? Well, it wasn't for prestige. In those days, circuit riders held very little prestige in society. The reason Methodist circuit riders did what they did is they believed they had a message that people actually needed to hear. They believed that reaching people for Jesus Christ was worth any price. There was an urgency to their manner of life because they were driven by the conviction that Jesus Christ has come to redeem humankind. For local preachers uh, who carried on the ongoing responsibilities of day-to-day -day life in the local parish, their life wasn't a whole lot easier. These were folks who worked regular jobs. And remember, in those days, that usually meant sun up to sundown and maybe a little bit longer. And in addition to that, they carried a full load of providing the spiritual care for their local parish. Why did they do it? Because the call of Christ was upon them. The itinerant and local preacher took the unchanging message of Christ to a nation that was all about change. C.S. Lewis says the vernacular is the real test. If you can't turn your faith into it, you either don't understand it or you don't believe it. And the local preacher and the itinerant preacher took the message of Christ and brought it in a way that folks could understand. Now, there was a slow but subtle change taking place as we move into the 1880s or, or into the 1800s. Being an itinerant called for a greater sacrifice than, than being a local preacher. In 1889, there were about 1,600 local preachers, but only about 600 itinerants. Itinerants had a much shorter life expectancy than was common among Americans at the time. And at the turn of the 20th century, we're only talking an average life expectancy of about 47. Theirs was somewhere closer to 30. But if death didn't cause retirement for them, Wives often did. <laughs> it was not easy to have a family life and be an itinerant, and, so, and they didn't have a lot of money, a lot of extra time, so a lot of itinerants would leave the itineracy upon finding someone to marry. Now, the choice to do that, to become localized, meant that you no longer got any support from the church. You became a local preacher. It also meant that you gave up your membership in the conference. You no longer had spiritual direction uh, to give to the conference, you were no longer considered one of the directors of that conference. As American Methodism gained more members, money, and clout, churches began demanding that they have their own clergy. Parsonages and much smaller circuits allowed Methodist clergy to begin living like the clergy of other denominations. Gradually, the roles of itinerant preacher and local pastor, local preacher, became indistinguishable. And that's why today we still have a lot of confusion about why some preachers get a vote at an annual conference and some don't, and some can serve as, uh, as, as the one who's providing the sacraments, but they can't go to general conference. We have a lot of confusion uh, around what it means to be a member of the conference and to be ordained because of the blurring of those two roles. <laughs> 